Thank you, Jenna. Um, I'm excited to get into the sermon with you, but uh, before we do that, would you join me in a word of prayer? Well, God, thank you for this time that we have to study your word together. Um, Lord, I pray that you would uh, send your Holy Spirit now to open us up. God, help us to hear your voice. Help us to hear the love and the affirmation that you always have for us, God, but also uh, open us to the ways that you're challenging us, the ways that you're pushing us to grow. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Uh, So um, sometimes in life, we have a problem, and we know we have a problem, and we think we know what is causing the problem, so we think we know how to fix the problem, But we try, and we try, and it doesn't work because actually there's there's something else that's causing the problem. Let me give you an example so you know what in the world I'm talking about. Um, Several years ago, I um, it was the end of the day. I went to pick up my son from preschool. He was about four years old at the time, and I was buckling him into his car seat in the back seat of my car. And he looked up at me and he said, "Dad, my head hurts." And I looked at him, and his face was a little bit flushed, and this was like mid-July, and he had just been playing outside. And so I handed him his water bottle and said, drink some water. You're probably just a little dehydrated. That'll make your headache go away. Uh, Fast forward about an hour, and we're in a restaurant eating dinner, and my son looks at me again, and he says, Dad, my head hurts, and now my neck hurts too. And I'm like, huh, maybe you're a little more dehydrated than I thought. I got him some more water. I was like, Drink this water, it'll make the problems go away. Fast forward about an hour, now we're back home. My son says to me again, Dad, my head really hurts, and my neck hurts, and it's, it's getting worse. And so I went to the kitchen to get some more water. And at that point, my wife, who is smarter than me and also a much better parent, uh, she said, have you taken his temperature? And I was like, well, I'm pretty sure he's just dehydrated, but I mean, I'll get the thermometer out if you want me to. Uh, So I got the thermometer out, checked his temperature. It turns out he was at 103. And at that point, I was like, maybe this is not just a little dehydration. So like any millennial parent, I took out my phone and started Googling the symptoms, which is always a little risky. Um, But what I found is maybe something you already know, and that is if your child has a high fever and neck pain, you need to go get that checked out right away. And so to make a long story short, we went to urgent care, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. Meanwhile, my son's head and neck pain is getting worse. Uh, They sent us to the ER. At first, the ER couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, They ran a bunch of tests. And then finally, a doctor came in and told us that my son did not have dehydration like I had originally thought, but actually he had meningitis. Um, Fortunately, it was viral meningitis, which is less dangerous than bacterial meningitis, but still, that was terrifying and overwhelming to hear. Uh, My son had to spend a few days in the hospital, and he got rest, and they pumped him full of even more fluids, and they gave him antiviral medication, and uh, thanks be to God, he made a full recovery. Within about a week, he was back home and, and back to normal. But why do I share that story? When my son looked at me and he told me, my head hurts, I knew we had a problem, And I thought I knew what the problem was, dehydration. So I thought I knew how to fix it. Keep drinking more water, son. Keep drinking more water. But that didn't work. And it was never going to work because actually there was something else that was causing the problem. Now, you may be wondering, what in the world does that have to do with you? Here's what it has to do with you. Don't take this the wrong way. um, But I'm pretty sure that you have a problem. And I think if you're honest, you know that you have a problem, and you're not alone because I'm pretty sure I have the same problem that you have. What am I talking about? I think most of us, most of the time, we feel deeply dissatisfied. We feel dissatisfied with our lives. Um, On a deeper level, we feel dissatisfied with ourselves. Why is that? Well, for one thing, We so badly want a sense of security in life. We want to feel peace. But this crazy world we live in has so much uncertainty. There's so much to be afraid of. 
that we don't have that security that our hearts crave and so we feel dissatisfied. Another reason is that we so badly want to feel affirmed. We want to feel loved. We want to feel like we're worthy of belonging, but we have so much self-doubt and we have so many voices outside of us and even in our own heads that are constantly tearing us down that we don't have that sense of affirmation that our hearts crave and so we feel dissatisfied. Another reason is that we so badly want to feel healed. We want to feel whole and complete, but we have so much pain We have so much brokenness in our lives. We don't have that sense of healing that we long for. It's just like when my son told me that his head hurt. We we know that we have a problem. And we think we know what's causing the problem. And so we think we know how to solve the problem. I wonder if you stop and think about it. How are you trying to fix your dissatisfaction problem in your life? How are you trying to fix it? For some of us, it's money, right? We think the reason that I don't feel secure in life is because I I don't have enough money. And so if I can earn more, if I can save more, if I can invest more, then I'll finally feel secure. Uh, For some of us, it's success, right? We think the reason that I don't feel affirmed is because I haven't achieved enough. I haven't accomplished enough. So if I can go get that promotion, if I can advance that far in my career, if I can win the approval of that group of people, then I will finally feel affirmed. For some of us, about to step on somebody's toes now, I apologize. For some of us, it's self-care. We think the, the reason that I don't feel whole and healed and complete is because I haven't done enough self-care. If I can just get more of the things that I want, if I can get more of the experiences that I want, if I can spend more time on me like I want to, then I will finally feel healed. And so we spend our whole lives chasing more money, chasing more success, chasing all these different forms of self-care. But does it work? Does it really work? I think if we're honest, what we would say is no. What happens? We get more money and we still feel insecure. We, we get more achievement. I'm, I'm looking at a room full of people, of, you all are so accomplished, you have achieved so much, and yet, well, we still don't feel affirmed. We, we do every form of self-care under the sun, and yet we still lack this sense of wholeness and healing in our life. Why? It's like when I was telling my son, just drink more water, just drink more water. It's never going to work. Why is that? Because there's something else that's causing the problem. And so the question is, if it's actually not about money, if it's not about success and achievements, if it's not about self-care, what is really driving this dissatisfaction problem that we have? What's driving it? Fortunately, we don't have to figure this out on our own uh, because we have a God who loves us and cares about us. We have a God who knows us better than we know ourselves. And so God is caring enough, God is honest enough to tell us the truth about our problem. And I got to warn you here. As we get into this, sometimes the truth hurts, right? Sometimes the truth, we don't want to hear it. It's challenging. But what does Jesus say? Jesus says the truth will set you free. That's right. And my guess is that some of us came to church today because we want to be set free, right? And I would argue that all of us need to be set free. And so with that in mind, let's turn our attention to Scripture now. And let's open ourselves up as best we can to hear a word that is challenging, but a powerful and important word of truth. Uh, A minute ago, Jenna read this passage to us from Exodus chapter 20. Let me quickly give you the context so you know what's going on. About 3,000 years ago, the Israelite people were slaves in Egypt. They were slaves there for 400 years. And they cried out to God, and God heard their cry, God sent them this leader named Moses. Some of you remember Moses. Moses goes and he confronts Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he leads the Israelite people uh, out of Egypt. And remember, Moses parts the Red Sea, and then finally the Israelites make it to freedom on the other side. But within 
days, probably within hours, the Israelites begin to feel dissatisfied. And it's that same dissatisfaction that you and I still feel today. They, they want to be secure. They want to be affirmed. They want healing for the pain in their lives. And just like us, they start looking to all these different things in the world around them to help them satisfy those longings of their heart. And God is looking at what's going on, and God can see that this is never going to work. And so in God's love, in God's mercy, God decides to intervene. And here in this passage in Exodus chapter 20, God has called Moses up to the top of this mountain called Mount Sinai. And God says, Moses, uh, I'm getting ready to give you some rules. I'm getting ready to give you some commandments that are going to help the people to thrive and to flourish. And I wonder, do you remember the very first commandment that God gave? The, this is the first of the Ten Commandments. This is the, the number one commandment um, before all the 600 plus other commandments that God would eventually give the Israelite people. God says to Moses, God says to the Israelites, God says to us, because Jesus echoes this same thing to us in the New Testament. You ready for it? Here's rule number one. Above all else, God says, you must have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. Let's just say this phrase out loud together. Say, no other gods. No gods. One more time with more conviction. Come on, no other gods. No other gods. There we go. Yes, this is, so, this is so powerful. Do you see what God is trying to communicate to us here? God is saying, listen, the reason that you keep chasing security and you can't find it the reason that you keep looking for affirmation and healing and you can't find it is because you have put other gods before me. You've made money your God. You've made success, achievement your God. You've made self-care even your God. And you've put your hope, you've put your trust, you've put your faith in those gods. This is what the Bible calls idolatry. Somebody say idolatry. idolatry. Yes, what is idolatry? Here's a working definition for us. Idolatry is whenever we trust something that is not God to give us what only God can give us. Let me say that again. Idolatry is whenever we trust something that is not God to give us what only God can give us. Uh, money can be a good thing. Success can be a good thing. Self-care, don't send me any angry emails. Self-care can be a good thing. I said it. I'm on record. It can be. Lots of things in this world can be a good thing, but those things turn bad as soon as we start to trust those things for what only God can give us. And that's why as God has given these commandments, the second commandment, rule number two, is actually just an extension of the first commandment. Did you catch this? Rule number one, no other gods before me. Rule number two is this. God says, do not make an idol for yourself. Do not make an idol. Why does God say this to us? Is it because God is some kind of divine narcissist? God needs the praise. God needs to be number one, to feel good about God's self. No, this is not about God at all. God is telling us this for our own good because you know what God knows about us? Those idols that we make in our lives, they are never going to satisfy us. It's never going to happen. That's number one. Number two, as we make idols, you know what is going to happen? We are going to hurt ourselves and we're going to hurt other people as well. Can I ask you a painful question? What have you sacrificed for the sake of your idols? Can I ask you a more painful question? Who, who have you sacrificed for the sake of your idols? Maybe you were working hard 
You were grinding away. You were side hustling away, trying to get more money that you thought was going to make you feel secure. And you didn't realize that the whole time you were actually sacrificing your marriage. Maybe you were working nights, working weekends, putting in the hours, trying to advance in your career because you thought if you made it to that one point, you would finally feel affirmed. But the whole time, you didn't realize that you were actually sacrificing your relationship with your children. Maybe you were working on your boundaries, working on your boundaries, making more and more time for you to focus on you, but you didn't realize that the whole time you were sacrificing your friends. Maybe you were living life for yourself, setting your own priorities, living by your own agenda, thinking that that was going to lead you to the long, deepest longings of your hearts, and you didn't realize that the whole time you were sacrificing your relationship with God. You see, that's what happens. God knows this about us. That's what happens when we make idols for ourselves. And so this is not about God and God's own good. This is about us. This is why God tells us, no other gods before me. I don't know how this message lands with you, um, but for me, all of this is deeply convicting. This was a painful sermon for me to prepare because it forced me in a very personal way to see all the different idols that I have in my life. It forced me to see the way I have sacrificed my own wife, my own children, my own friends, my own relationship with God. Uh, It was kind of ironic just this week, there were several evenings where um, my kids would get home from school, my wife would be home from work, and I should have stopped working And I should have gone and invested in my relationship with them. But you know what I did? I kept working. I kept working. Why? Because I want to be successful. I want to achieve. Because maybe then I will finally feel affirmed. I'm over here worshiping, sacrificing to this idol. And I'm supposed to be a Christian. I'm supposed to be a pastor even, setting an example. It's convicting to me. And maybe some of you are feeling some of that same conviction this morning as well. But as so often happens with the gospel, uh, even as I am deeply convicted, this message also fills me with so much hope. It gives me so much hope because when I recognize the true cause of my problem, I can get to work actually fixing that problem. It kind of reminds me of when I was sitting in the ER with my son. And the doctor finally came in and and told us that my son had meningitis. That was scary. That was overwhelming. That was a truth that I did not want to hear. But you know what? It was good. And it was necessary. That was an important truth because that truth allowed the doctors to begin fixing the problem. And the same is true for us. When we realize that the driving force behind all of our dissatisfaction in life is actually idolatry, we can get to work then tearing our idols down, tearing our idols down, tearing our idols down so that we can put God first where God always, always belongs. And you know what happens when we do that? You know what happens? We find a sense of security like we could have never imagined we find a kind of affirmation that we could have never imagined, a kind of healing that we couldn't even have believed was possible. Now, here's how Jesus puts it in the New Testament. Have you ever heard this before? This is amazing. Jesus says in John 6, he says, I am the bread of life. What are you talking about, Jesus? He says, whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, listen to me, all your deepest hungers in life can be satisfied in me. All your deepest thirsts can be satisfied in me if you would just come to me, if you would just tear your idols down and put me first, Jesus is telling us. And so, um, to help us with this, uh, over the next three weeks, we're going to be in a sermon series called Counterfeit Gods. Counterfeit gods, and we're going to be looking at uh, three of the most common and three of the most powerful idols in our lives. And I want to give you a quick sneak preview of what we're getting ready to talk about um, because I'm going to be coming after some stuff that may be near and dear to your hearts. 
I'm going to be coming after some stuff that may feel a little sensitive to you, so I don't want you to be surprised. I don't want you to feel personally uh, attacked. So where are we going in this series? Next week, next week we're talking about the idol of money. It's a big one, the idol of money. Now, uh, can I just, can I share something honest with you? I thought about not saying this because it might feel a little bit awkward, um, but I think you can handle it. Uh, th- there's this thing that happens here at Kindred. It's been like a, a pattern that I've observed consistently for several years now. And the pattern is, every time I preach on money, a whole bunch of people just skip worship. <laughs> and, and you, I mean, you can see it in the numbers. It's very clear. Every time I preach on money, the, the sermon downloads on our podcast go way, way down. And if I can be honest with you for a second, when that happens... It kind of hurts my feelings. I'm serious. It makes me feel like I'm a bad pastor because it makes me feel like I must not have earned your trust. I mean, if, like, if you're new here and you don't really know me yet and you don't know Kindred Church, I get why you wouldn't trust me. There's a bazillion good reasons to not trust pastors in 2024 for sure. But for those of you that have been around a while, For those of you who have gotten to know me and to know my heart, I guess I would have just hoped that I I would have earned your trust by now. I I would have hoped that you would trust me enough to know that I would never get up here and say anything to you that wasn't coming from a place of love. I would have hoped that I would have earned your trust enough that you would at least come and hear me out. Even if you disagree with what I have to say, that's okay. Uh, For those of you that have been following Jesus for a while, I guess I would hope that you have reached a level in your discipleship where you would be open to the possibility that maybe there's a message God wants you to hear, even if it makes you uncomfortable, because that's how God pushes us to grow. And so, again, I'm sorry if that's awkward to say, um, but next week is on money. If you want to skip, I get it, I get it, but I hope at least some of you will come with an open heart and an open mind and hear me out even if you disagree with what I have to say. So that's your disclaimer. Next week's about the idol of money. What are we talking about the week after that? Uh, We're going to go to a topic that is even more controversial. Uh, We're going to talk about the idol of sex. The idol of sex. Uh, Sex can be good. I was just going to pause there and see if anybody wanted to amen that. Um, Okay. Uh, Sex can be good. um, But sex can also become a very powerful and destructive idol in our lives, and we want to guard against that. So we're going to talk about that. The sermon is not going to be overly graphic. Uh, This is not a how-to sermon. Most of y'all seem to have figured that out. Um, But I did want to give the parents a heads up. You may want to put your little ones in childcare if you don't usually do that. The elementary schoolers will, of course, be out of the room um, at elementary Bible time. For middle and high school, you know, parents, use your judgment on that. I mean, I I think it's probably a good conversation for middle and high school students to, to hear. And you can chat with your student after the sermon about it. Uh, but that's where we're going in a couple weeks. If I am still employed by Kindred Church, um, by week three of this series, we're going to talk about the idol of control. Um, I know we got a lot of control freaks here at Kindred Church. I'm not making eye contact. I can be a control freak sometimes. Candace and Bonnie are nodding in the back. Uh, we're going to go after that idol of control. So that's where we're going. And I'm excited about this series. If I'm honest with you, I'm a little nervous about the series. Because my hope and my goal is to push you and to challenge you, Kindred Church, in a way that I haven't to this point. But you know what? A number of you have come to me separately lately and said, Daniel, uh, you could take the gloves off, okay? Like, enough of this milk toast stuff. Like, we want to be challenged. We want to learn. We want to grow. So here you go. Uh, I'm I'm trying to give you what you have have asked for. Uh, I hope you'll come with an open heart and an open mind. Uh, I really think God is going to do some good work in us. I know as I've been working on this series, God has already been doing good work in me. So that's, that's where we're going over the next few weeks. Um, before today, I want to end the sermon here by doing something that is uh, a little different than what we normally do. Uh, I'm going to invite um, Tanner to come out and to, uh, to play a little music for us. And what I want to do is just lead us in a few minutes of prayer. Um, because, again, I know, at least for me, this was a message that was convicting. And as I was working on it, I know it stirred up within me um, some guilt and some feelings of shame at the idols that I have made for myself in, 
in my life, um, and I think to a certain extent it's appropriate to feel a, a, a sense of guilt and shame as we think about the ways that we put other things before God, and, and yet we have a God who loves us so much and is so merciful, and when we're in that place of guilt and shame, God says, hey, come to me, bring it to me. God has arms wide open, and so I just want to lead us in a time of prayer where we come to God, where we honestly confess our idols, where we ask for God's help to tear those idols down and, and practice putting God first in our lives. Um, so if you're comfortable with it, would you just uh, kind of sit up straight, and, and Tanner, you can um, begin to play for us whenever, and um, just sit up straight, and, and if you would, would you just uh, put your palms up, kind of open your hands, you can rest them in your lap, you can uh, rest them on your knees, whatever's comfortable. It's just kind of a physical way of uh, opening ourselves up to God's presence. And would you bow your head with me? And, and would you open your heart to God? Father God, uh, we, we cry out to you this morning because we need your help, Lord, desperately. God, our hearts crave security and peace. Our hearts crave uh, love and affirmation. We crave healing for the brokenness and the pain in our lives. And we know that you put those longings in our hearts to draw us closer to you. And so we should run to you. We should serve you. We should worship you. But we confess, God, that we, we don't and we haven't. Uh, we, we've put all of these other gods before you. We've put money before you. We've put success, status symbols, beauty, pleasure, the list goes on and on of all of the things that we've put before you, God. And, and we know that in the process, we've hurt ourselves. We know that in the process, God, we've hurt people that we care about. We've hurt our spouses and partners. We've hurt our children. We've hurt our friends, God. We've hurt people that you've called us to serve that we haven't. Most of all, God, we've sacrificed our relationship with you. And, and so, Jesus, we, we need you. We, we've made you a side thing. We've made you a low priority. We've made you something that we do on Sunday mornings. And we need to put you first in our lives. Jesus, help us, as painful as it is, to recognize those idols that we have. Jesus, help us to tear those idols down so that we can put you first so that we can put you first. The bread of life, the only thing, the only thing that can ever truly satisfy our hearts. And now as we continue to pray together, um, all around the room, whether, whether you're a lifelong follower of Jesus, whether you are new to following Jesus, maybe you're not yet a follower of Jesus, if you know that you need God today, if you know that you need Jesus, if you know that there are idols in your life that need to be torn down so that you can put Jesus first, I want to invite you to just say this next part of the prayer out loud with me. Uh, if you're not in that place emotionally, spiritually today, like no pressure on this, but if you know that this is something that you need, uh, would, would you just repeat after me? Would you just say, Father God, say, I give you my heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Say, Holy Spirit, make me brand new. Say, help me tear down my idols so I can put you first. Amen, 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 amen. Uh, would you stand now and let's practice as we sing. Let's practice in this moment. Now, putting God first, truly first in our lives.